Should the average investor invest in individual stocks? And if we do, should the companies we invest in pay a dividend? And how should we go about evaluating the value of that dividend? My name is Rob Berger. I'm the founder of DoorRoller.net, the host of this podcast, and I should say an investor in individual stocks that happen to pay a dividend. On today's show, we have a very special guest. His name is Josh Peters. He's a chartered financial analyst and author. He happens to work for Morningstar, and he's going to give us the inside scoop on dividend investing. Welcome to the Dough Roller Podcast, where the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. We help you make more, spend less, and invest the rest. And now your host, Rob Berger. Whether you're just starting out buried under a mountain of debt or well on your way to financial freedom, this is the podcast to help you take your finances to the next level. Hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. Hey, I got a really good show for you today. I was really excited about uh, this interview. I interviewed Josh Peters, and uh, you know, I've, I've read his book, The Ultimate Dividend Playbook, uh, a number of years ago. I actually reread it recently. It's an excellent book on dividend investing. I happened to get an opportunity to connect with, with Josh, and he agreed to come on the show. I want to get to that interview uh, uh, now. What I'm going to do after the interview, uh, I'll share some of my thoughts about what Josh had to say and about his book. And then I'm going to share with you my portfolio of individual stocks, such as it is, for better and for worse, including how they've performed over the last, oh, about three and a half years. I actually put together uh, the portfolio in terms of performance using Morningstar's Portfolio Manager. I'll talk a little bit about that. And I was really stunned, actually, at the results, at the returns, the performance of these investments going back, as I say, till 2012. So I will share that with you after the interview. But first, uh, I want to introduce you to Josh Peters. Josh, welcome to the show. Nice to be here today with you. Well, I am so glad that you took time out of your busy schedules. For folks that might not know who you are, tell us who Josh Peters is and what you do. Well, my title is uh, Director of Equity Income Strategy for Morningstar. Uh, just as easy to go by, you know, Morningstar's uh, bearded dividend guy. Um, and uh, I've had this uh, position now for a little over 10 years. We've actually just uh, in January celebrated the 10-year anniversary of the model portfolio I manage, as well as the newsletter, Morningstar Dividend Investor, uh, that I write and, and edit that is built around that portfolio. And my animating spirit, you know, what is behind, you know, my interest in dividend paying stocks and the strategy that we have in the newsletter, the way I write about and think about the financial markets, is it's all about very practical, real world, useful results from stocks. Most of Wall Street, in fact, almost all of Wall Street is geared around this idea of a horse race, you know, that it's all about trying to beat your benchmark, beat the S&P 500 to do it every quarter, you know, regardless of whether that quarter is up or down or whatever. And that's not what most people are looking to do. That's the way money managers evaluate each other, maybe. Uh, but that's not necessarily what's going to serve the actual financial requirements, real-world financial needs of, of people who are out there. The, the biggest demand that is out there is for income, and it's not just because interest rates are low. It's because the baby boomers are retiring. You know, for most of them don't have those defined benefit pension plans to count on. They have to figure out how to turn their own 401ks and, and nest various nest eggs into income. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to just forget about this competition that you have with the market and instead focus on the businesses and how they're delivering value to you, the shareholder, directly through cash. So I figure as long as I've got a, a big uh, and still safe dividend uh, from a company that is able to grow over time and with the growth of that dividend on a per share basis, I've also got a, a good reason to expect some capital appreciation of a, a lasting type over the long run and you know, put these things together. I'm getting a good fundamental total return. Right. Uh, whether the market reflects that in any one month or quarter or year, you know, I, I honestly can't let myself worry that much about it. And I said uh, ten, more than 10 years ago, look, I'm not trying to beat the market. You know, don't expect me to beat the market every year. And since then, we've only beaten the S&P four out of the 10 years. But cumulatively, we've outperformed the S&P by, I think it was 9.4% annualized return to 
uh, 7.6% uh, for the S&P over the same time. So, you know, we, we essentially beat the market without trying. You know, just having a good strategy and focusing on what matters for the portfolio results we're looking at and what's going on in the individual companies, beating the market was just, uh, you know, a, a bonus, you know, an after effect of what's otherwise a very good and sound investment process. Well, that's, uh, that's great. And, you know, I, uh, my, sort of my goal for today is for you to share your wisdom on how folks who, who, who might be interested in investing in dividend pain stocks should go about it. But before we get into that, let me play devil's advocate for just a moment. Because uh, a lot of people will say, well, wait a minute, why even bother with all this stuff? Just put your money in an S&P 500 index fund. And in fact, that's something that I preach at people on this podcast. Uh, so why not just do that? And, and are, you know, who, are there some folks where you know, individual dividend paying stocks make sense and other folks that, nah, they should just stick with index funds? I think it it really comes back to what you're trying to accomplish, and there's there's two main characteristics that I think would point you in the direction of of a dividend orientation, uh, and then to express that with individual stocks. And the first is just the income preference. You know that if you actually have uh, current expenses, current withdrawals that you're making from your portfolio, uh, Wall Street's solution. Uh, is to just sell off however many shares you need in order to have you know the cash that you want to withdraw from your portfolio, right? You know, just call that living off the pile. Well, if you're familiar with a mathematical uh, little mathematical uh, trick uh, called dollar cost averaging, you know that as a, an investor, when you're putting money into the market, a fixed dollar amount over time, that that actually increases your return. It enhances your return because you're buying just automatically fewer shares when the price is high, but disproportionately more shares when the price is low. And your average cost to get in will be lower than the average stock price over that period or the average level of the market, say in an index fund. The problem with living off the pile once you go into withdrawal mode is that it's dollar cost averaging in reverse. And when the market plunges, as it does from time to time, all of a sudden you're selling off a large number of shares to meet even small withdrawals. You're, you're eating through the principal value, the capital value of your portfolio very quickly to try to maintain your lifestyle. So to, to have a, an, an orientation toward income within a total return concept or, or context, uh, but, but to try to get a portfolio that throws off, you know, independent of what is going on with stock prices, you know, say 4% yield, you know, I, I think of it as a hundred thousand dollar account that provi- provides four thousand dollars a year in annual income. If the market value drops to seventy five thousand, but none of the dividends get cut, uh, you've still got your income. You can still fund your withdrawal, and you're not having to be a seller at low prices. So there's this very practical value associated with being able to fund portfolio withdrawals. Mm-hmm. Now you might say, well, not everybody you know is funding withdrawals. You know, lots of people, most people are still in in saving mode. What about them? Shouldn't they just be in index funds? Well, here too, it's you know, there are risk characteristics uh, that I think are, are very attractive uh, associated with high quality dividend paying stocks when you can buy them at good prices. And, you know, that's why I say, you know, every stock that I own personally, uh, it pays a dividend, you know, and I've got quite a way, you know, maybe a couple of decades, you know, to go before I finally decide to hang it up. You know, why do I want the, the dividend income, even though I don't need it for spending purposes? It's because they're just a better class of companies mm-hmm. that are going to deliver me good returns with less risk, less headaches, you know, fewer sleepless nights. Uh, and I have the opportunity to definitely increase my income over time by reinvesting those dividends. You know, the difference you might say is that if the company keeps all the cash and has to reinvest it all inside the business and then hopefully that forces the stock price up, you know, the company may or may not be able to pull that off. Lots of companies destroy shareholder value and they just, you know, throw the cash away or the value of the cash away with bad investment decisions. As an investor, when I get that dividend, if I take my dividend income and I buy more shares of more dividend paying stocks, my income automatically goes up. Uh, and I can track my personal financial progress, the progress of my portfolio over time by how much dividend income it throws off. That's a big part of my strategy is, you know, don't focus so much on the market value, focus on the income, the growth of income. Are you avoiding dividend cuts? Are you getting the growth you expect? Mm-hmm. Eventually, that'll drive the market value up and you'll, you'll get the pile too, uh, but focus instead uh, on the income. You know, so there's, 
there's certainly a place, I think, for uh, index strategies and, and passive strategies, uh, but you have to be able to draw the line between the pr- investment products or, or investment strategy you have and the actual financial goals you're trying to, to reach. And for a lot of people, you know, it, they have specific income requirements either now or you know, expected in the future, and dividends are going to be more useful in meeting those, those future needs uh, than just a, an income agnostic, you know, in, income strategy. What, what about for those that say, yes, you're right. I, I, I need some, I want some dividend income either because I need it now to live on, or as you said, I just like the, the, the companies that pay dividends show, uh, you know, uh, an attitude towards shareholders and cash management that I think is, is, is ideal for a shareholder. So I buy in whether I'm, I'm 30 or, or 65. Yes, dividends are good. What about someone who says, yeah, but I'll just get it from a, you know, a Vanguard fund that focuses on dividend-paying companies? Yeah, you know, that, that's a good debate, too. You know, and th- this has really surged to the, the headlines you know, in this uh, business over the last year, you know, a couple of years, you know, real tough ones for active managers. Now, I'm an active manager, so obviously I believe there's value in active management, or I wouldn't be doing it. Uh, but I also have this orientation that says, I don't need to beat the market every year. This is not a horse race. I'm, I expect, you know, hopefully over the next 10 years, you know, I'm going to beat the index without trying. I'm going to focus on the income, and that's going to get me uh, a, a very good result in both an absolute and a relative sense. But it's still a very fair question to ask. You know, what am I doing that you can't get from, say, VIG, you know, the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF? Right, right. You know, that caught, you know, it's very... Uh, cost-effective, tax-efficient uh, product, um, and it's. I think it may be the most popular of the div- dividend ETFs out there. But here's the problem: uh, it only yields two percent, and that is basically the yield of the market average. The S and P 500 yields two percent right now. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, it says dividend, it has dividend in the name, and all the companies in there pay dividends, which means that hopefully they do care more about shareholders. Hopefully they are uh, making better capital allocation decisions because they have these dividends to pay. But me as a shareholder, I'm still not getting a distinctive result. You know, I'm getting the same from income that from VIG that I would get from you know, Spider, right? Uh, and I, I kind of take issue with this idea that there's such a thing as dividend growth investing. It's, it's actually, they're, they're as scarce as hen's teeth uh, to find companies that have very rapid growth but also distinguish themselves on the basis of dividend yield, you know, that let's say is in the mid to high 2% range or, or better. There just aren't a whole lot of companies like that. Uh, and so a dividend growth strategy just kind of becomes anything that is not oriented toward yield. The portfolio that I've put together, which is you know, currently 28 individual stocks, uh, there's nothing funky in there. I own a couple of very high-quality uh, midstream master limited partnerships, but other than that, there's some property REITs. There's no mortgage REITs. There's no BDCs. There's none, none of these uh, exploration and production partnerships, you know, that try to juice people's income, and now all their distributions have been cut because the price of oil has plunged. You know, these are like predictable risks that have manifested themselves here recently. You know, my portfolio yields almost 4%, so I'm getting double the income of the market average by having had the ability outside of an index setting to pick these individual stocks. Now, one thing I would add to that is that there are lots of ETFs out there that also are oriented around those high yields. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of those products, I've you know, even had a hand in, in helping develop some of those. Uh, the problem is, is that they're still largely you know, quantitative. They're looking backward or maybe looking at today's performance of the company, but those are not going to necessarily tip you off to the dividend that gets cut six months or a year from now and clobbers the stock price, you know, takes the stock price down 50%, you know, as, you know, your income gets cut too. So to have that, you know, qualitative and quantitative combination of forward-looking fundamental analysis to weed out the obvious losers or even some of the not-so-obvious losers that are going to go on to cut their dividends, that I think adds a lot of value relative to just a, you know, passive index strategy that even is oriented around those high yields. Yeah, and well, and that kind of brings me to, I guess, as we kind of turn towards actually investing in dividend stocks, how do you think, what accounts for your ability to have, have beaten the S&P 500 over the last 10 years? Because, you know, studies tell us most active management, at least in, the, in a mutual fund or context, 
on average, their, their odds of beating the S&P 500 over 10 years, not so good. How did you manage to do it? Well, part of it is that uh, the, the portfolio I manage, the only expenses that it has uh, are the commissions that we pay. Uh, all those years ago when we, when we booted up, originally it was two accounts, more recently we consolidated it to one, but uh, with each of those, Morningstar actually opened a discount brokerage account and deposited $100,000 uh, for me to trade those stocks that I was buying and selling with real money. You know, so our performance record is, you know, crystal clear. It's as it's as clear and, and transparent as it gets. Because when I say buy, I actually did buy it or am buying it. You know, if I sold, say sell, it's because I did sell it. Uh, so, and with that, you know, I pay ten dollars or nine dollars every time I make a trade. Uh, but there isn't, you know, the, you know, call it 100 basis points of uh, you know, management fees and other expenses that you have in, in mutual fund products. So that accounts for, uh, you know, some of the, the favorable performance relative to actual products. But, you know, the numbers I mentioned earlier, our first 10 years, we did 9.4% annualized. The S&P did 7.6. Well, the S&P has no transaction costs in it. So that's a, a pretty close apples to apples comparison. And the big variance there was income. I, I went through all of our performance data and I separated just the effect of changes in stock prices, just the capital gain and loss component, and uh, uh, then looked separately at the dividend income component of our total return since inception. And what I found is that just on stock prices, you know, we'd actually lagged a little bit. Uh, the market went up more than you know just the, the value of our capital gains, but this whole time the S&P 500 is yielding around two percent, and our portfolios actually yielded, I want to say somewhere on average you know north of four, uh, and that accounted that made up for the capital gains that uh, we didn't get, uh, as well as you know put us you know well into the black on a relative comparison. And what's interesting is it's the kind of decision that I think anybody can make to prioritize income, and then you get this much more reliable source of return that gives you a lot of personal financial flexibility. Uh, but there are there's still a lot of built-in bias against uh, these companies, especially among institutional money managers. You know, they don't want to be too different than the S and P 500 because then they might perform differently, and it might not be in their favor. Uh, I figure if you want a differentiated result, you have to have a differentiated strategy. <laughs> right, sure. Uh, and so I'm I'm willing to to be different. You know, I have you know much more exposure to utilities and REITs uh, and staples than the market average. Uh, at this point, I don't own any tech stocks. What? And no tech stocks. I, I have I have zero <laughs> I have a zero weight in tech. Yeah, you know, yeah. which is you know the biggest sector of the S and P 500 because I just can't find companies that I'm real you know that I really have a lot of confidence both in their their capital allocation practices and their dividend policies and their ability to maintain the their businesses their earnings power and, and cash flow you know indefinitely into the future when things change so much right, you know there's, right. there's a reason why a general mills has gone 115 or 116 years without ever having to cut its dividend uh, you know and and you can count on something like that it's just not a business that changes very very rapidly right. people are still going to be eating cereal and granola bars and yogurt and things like that i think in another 100 years i'm not going to have to worry about that any of these tech companies you know, I just don't. I can't have, develop that same same level of confidence. I'm not saying I I wouldn't consider owning a tech stock, but boy, you know the the, the hurdle's a little taller, uh, and uh, I just don't. I don't need it. I don't have to have a tech uh, exposure so that I don't look too different from the index. Yes. I want a different result, so I'm going to look different. Right. Well, and I tell you, I, I own shares of Apple, and I've been very happy with it. But that's my concern for Apple. I mean, yes, they've had. It seems like hit after hit after hit, but it, that can't last forever. It just can't. I mean, you know, the odds of that happening for the next hundred years. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, Pepsi is not going to have the same challenge. It'll have its own challenges, but it, it's not going to have, as you say, the challenge that a technology company, even one as strong as Apple, uh, yeah, Apple. Will face. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Apple. I'm sitting here at my desk. I've got a big iMac here. I've got my iPhone uh, right next to me. You know, there's got to be three iPads in the house. I've had iPods. I mean, I got an Apple TV. I got it all. I don't think I'm going to go for the watch, but uh, <laughs> I don't wear I don't wear a watch. But 
I'm I'm a huge fan, and it was a big deal. It was a very big deal when Apple initiated a dividend because yes, the company is so big and so profitable right off the get go that it actually just all by itself moved the yield of the whole market a little bit. Uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars. But you know, I, I put it in this mental framework that if you had Apple trading, let's say, with a 3% yield, which at one point the yield did get kind of close to there when the stock was in a funk here uh, you know, a year or two ago. If you put a, a yield of 3% on, on Apple, is this the same as a 3% yield on General Mills? It's like, no, because I can't look out five years and have uh, much confidence that Apple's going to be able to just continue to be the hit factory and maintain these incredible profit margins. And if they don't, then the stock is not going to do well, and it's not you know the dividend is going to be a rounding error in the performance of of the stock. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, General Mills, on the other hand, I mean they're in kind of a funk right now too. You know, people are not uh, you know buying uh, quite as many of those center of the store uh, grocery items. You know, there's a little bit more health consciousness, and competition is ramped up a little bit. You know, these things come and go. I mean, even the food industry has some some little cycles to it. But in five years, it's going to be a bigger, more profitable company. Uh, that will have, I imagine, raised the dividend, you know, a good six, seven, eight percent a year over over that time, and chances are very good that's going to correlate to stock price appreciation yep. Yep. in that general range on average. It's just, you know, I, I no no matter how how good the dividend is, it doesn't turn a bad business into a good investment. Mm-hmm. And Apple's a great business. The question is, can it can it sustain right. that? And, uh, boy, I am the last person who should be allowed to answer a question like that. <laughs> yeah, well, me, you and me both. Um, I mean, I'm sticking with it for now, but I have the exact same concern. Okay, well, let's kind of get practical then. For folks listening, they, they say, okay, I, I may want to invest in some dividend-paying stocks, or maybe they already do, but can you? how does one go about approaching this? Are there is there a framework that someone can use? Are, are, is there some criteria that you look to when you're picking uh, companies that you want to uh, possibly invest in? Well, it starts with having a, a basic read of the market. You know, what can I get in terms of a, of a dividend yield? You know, what's the sweet spot? I think right now where we're at, you know, in a low interest rate environment, uh, you know, very low interest rate environment, uh, in a period here where stock prices and, and valuations, you know, are at pretty high levels uh, in a historic context, you don't want to be thinking in terms of I need to get you know a six or seven or eight percent yield from my portfolio because you push up that high, and there are stocks that there are stocks out there that have double digit yields, but they're they're there for a reason. That yield is telling you that that dividend is very risky, uh, whether it seems to be sustainable or not. Uh, you know, it could be you know a mortgage rate you know where every time they shape of the yield curve changes, the dividend rate is going to change. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, then definitely don't own one of these things. <laughs> right. um, you know, they're, they're, they're basically complicated bets on interest rates. You know, these aren't, aren't businesses that most people, you know, can readily uh, understand and be able to predict the performance of. So, but at the same time, uh, I think you want more than the, you know, very run-of-the-mill pedestrian 2% yield that you get from the market. So, my sense of where that sweet spot is 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 somewhere in the high threes to to four percent, and my portfolio right now yields uh, about three point nine percent. So once you've got that, then it's okay. How do I put the co- the collection of companies together? You know that can can meet that. And my basic screen is I look for dividend yields over three percent. You know, which is not to say I'm not occasionally willing to make an exception and go a little bit lower if there's a lot of growth, but basically 3% is where I start. And then, you know, I'm, I'm looking up to as high as I can go without having a, a lot of risk. And then, you know, I, and these are, are proprietary metrics for Morningstar, but I look for uh, economic moat uh, ratings that we have of narrow or wide. And what that just implies is that we think the company has a very strong competitive position, you know, wider being stronger than narrow, but both of those being better than none. Uh, and every so often I have somebody ask me, well, why don't you own DuPont or Dow? You know, these are companies that pay dividends for hundreds of years or whatever. You know. It's like, well, look at how poorly the dividends have grown over time. You know, they, these are cyclical businesses that can't really control their costs 
uh, or what they're able to charge for their products. And Dow Chemical used to brag about how it had never cut its dividend since it had gone public you know, very early in the 20th century, and they cut the dividend then in 2009. Uh, these are, you know, the dividend bounces back, but it's just a deep cyclical. You know, it's not steadily creating value for shareholders like you would would hope, I think, to to see in conjunction with a, a large and growing dividend. So, you know, I and that's and that's an excellent proxy for quality too to find a business that is uh, got a good chance of of maintaining a strong competitive position, you know, over a very long period of time. Uh, and, you know, from there, you know, I started digging into individual companies and I just, you know, it's all about the dividend. You know, it, it, it's weird. You know, I said, you know, I'm the bearded dividend guy, you know, but it's, it's really true. Uh, when I'm looking at an individual stock, everything that I consider about the business goes through the, the lens, if you will, of its impact on the dividend. You know, is it safe? Will it grow? And what kind of total return can I expect based on the, the dividend yield that the stock is priced for and the subsequent growth rate of the dividend that I'm expecting? And anything else that you consider about the business, the quality of management, capital allocation practices, uh, you know, financial leverage, operating leverage, the cyclicality of revenues, all those things get organized into these, these three questions. And that's the way I present the analyses in the newsletter because that's the way I actually go about looking at these these businesses. And it it provides a really good tool for connecting A to B. You know, connecting all you know, organizing all this information about an individual stock and helping me pick even the stocks that I want to look at and then organizing the information about them. I'm just going to bypass the whole circus of the stock market and everything on TV every day and go right to how does this affect my income stream in my portfolio. You know, does this play a positive role or not? Well, let me let me ask a kind of a specific question because that's all very helpful. You mentioned one of the metrics you mentioned was financial leverage. I know that's one of the met- metrics you talk about in your book. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm looking at a stock that I own, which does not pay a three percent yield. I, I own shares of D- uh, Deer and Company. Their financial okay. their financial leverage at the end of their last fiscal year was six point seven seven. Right? What does that mean, and how should one go about evaluating that? Yeah, that, that that's a good point. One of the the problems that you run into when you're trying to do what I do a lot, which is trying to help people help themselves, you know, educate them, you know, here's not just, you know, buy, you know, such and such stock, but here's how to think about it, here's how to evaluate it, is that there are lots of non-obvious ways that uh, those statistics might be less meaningful. And Deer is a good example because most of the leverage at at Deer is at its financing subsidiary, uh, where they lend you know, money to dealerships to, for inventory, and they lend money to uh, farmers to buy their equipment. Right. And that type of a business, well, it's basically a bank. You know, they're borrowing money on Wall Street as opposed to t- taking deposits, uh, and then they're lending it to another group of people at a higher interest rate. You know, you have to pull that out of the balance sheet, basically, and look at the, that banking business, that financing business on a standalone basis, and then look at the rest of the balance sheet. Uh, and when I when I looked at Deer that way, as I, I did a, a few months ago, I was you know giving the stock a look. It was down around $80, and I thought, oh, you know, the yields come up here. You know, let me think about uh, about this. Uh, you know, I was I felt like they were continuing as they have done historically to manage their balance sheet conservatively because it's a very deeply cyclical industry, and the cycle right now is is heading south on them. I live in central Illinois, and uh, you know, there's, I can kind of you know, just be. A, you know, it's very easy when you live in farm country to be aware of the fact that crop prices are falling. And with it, farm incomes and the wherewithal to buy brand new tractors and combines and, and other equipment. So, you know, I don't, I, I got the sense that, you know, they're not going to have to cut the dividend, uh, even though earnings are going to come down. Uh, you know, the balance sheet is strong for a reason so that they can continue to maintain that uh, commitment to shareholders even during the downturn. But it's not likely that there's going to be much for dividend growth while earnings are dropping. And it's a cycle, you know, cyclical downturn that could last for a while. So I said, yeah, it's a, deer is a high quality business. It's what we look at as a, a wide moat business. You know, very very strong competitor uh, in agricultural equipment. Uh, the trouble being that you know it's going to trade you know up and down based on those cycles. And I just didn't feel like it was cheap enough uh, to to buy at this point. So. 
So that, you know, but, you know, the question on financial leverage, you know, sometimes the best you know, shortcut is just what's the company's credit rating. Okay. And Deer, I think has has a, an A or A minus uh, credit rating. You know, I, I, I don't quote me on that, yeah, even though does. everybody's listening. It's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. That, that that's a pretty solid number because the, the credit rating agencies are aware of the cyclicality of the business as well as management's history of dealing with that cyclicality. You know, that expresses you know that the company's got a, a reasonably strong balance sheet. And then you have to compare the dividend to you know how far could earnings drop? Well. Or, Deer could conceivably lose money at the bottom of a really deep cycle. And if you go back to the 80s, 1980s, when things were really, really bad, uh, they actually you know, had cut their dividend uh, several times. But the last couple of downturns in the industry uh, over the last few decades, they haven't had to resort to a dividend cut. So I think that's, that's a more positive sign that uh, they can maneuver through this next down cycle without having to cut the dividend. You just got to be aware that the cycle could last a while. Uh, it could be a while before the stock really makes an, an upside move. It could be a while before the dividend grows again. And if it gets bad enough, uh, then the dividend, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility. They could have to cut the dividend. And, uh, you know, so you got to be true to yourself going in. Is this something where if the stock price falls by half and maybe the dividend is even going to be cut, you know, could I still buy more? You know, so that I can come out of this with a good total return at the end. Because you're not going to go bust. If they cut the dividend, they'll bring it back. But uh, that's not necessarily the risk profile that, that most dividend investors are looking for. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting to listen to you because as I thought about, you know, the, what you were saying, it, it really describes exactly, the, for me, the kind of company I want to invest in, which is one where I don't really have any, you know, reason to believe the company is in peril at all. Uh, but it's got a lot of headwinds right now. You know, I mean, commodity prices are down. And so, as you said, people don't buy tractors. You know, there'll be some pent-up demand. Eventually, it'll, it'll spring back, but don't know when, right? Uh, yeah, my, my complaint is much more about valuation in that yeah. you're, you're looking at a, a pretty significant downturn in U.S. farm incomes, and that's the, the bulk of Deere's operating income, you know, comes from making tractors for American farmers. And then you pull up a stock price chart, and you know the stock hasn't really made any real forward progress here since uh, in about four years, since early 2011. You know, I just pulled up the chart here on my computer. It got up close to 100 bucks, and you know today it's around 90. Now the rest of the market's done very well. Uh, you know, so Deer has certainly underperformed relative to the market. But you kind of ask yourself, the stock is still up pretty close to its all-time high range, even though earnings are, are going into the tank. Uh, <laughs> you know, at, at a point, you, you want to be able to say, hmm, you know, am I really paying a price that, you know, is going to give me, you know, the old Graham and Dodd margin of safety for this cycle lasting longer or, or, or taking me, the company down further? Mm-hmm. Uh, than people currently expect. You know, there's a fair amount of optimism or at least sort of happy-go-lucky attitude, I think, in, in the stock price, uh, you know, up here. Now, that's not to say it's it's hugely overvalued. I think our, our analyst has a, a fair value estimate on deer that's in the neighborhood of where it's trading now. But if you want to be a buyer of a cyclical business like this, I think you want to pay a a, a pretty good discount and then if on top of that you are interested primarily in income, you have to ask yourself very carefully, it, does this play the kind of role in meeting my need to you know, maintain and, and grow a stream of income? Uh, or is this something that is uh, you know, maybe better for other types of strategies? You know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of the Apple story again. Uh, in that a stock can have a yield of you know three percent or or maybe even more you know an above average yield, but that doesn't mean it has the risk characteristics you know the the predictability that leads to the confidence to to expect a good result. Uh, yeah, so you know that one's that one's tough. You know if I'm going to buy a cyclical, I typically want it uh, pretty cheap, and I, I don't think of deer as being being cheap. Now. Interesting, interesting. Well, what about return on equity? How important is that uh, to your investment decisions? It's, there's another statistic that can be just so messed up. <laughs> uh, obviously, I, I like it to be higher as opposed to lower, but it, you really have to acquaint yourself with the balance sheet of an individual business. Uh, Clorox, for example, 
uh, at some points over the last couple of years, their shareholder equity has actually been negative. And, you know, you get people, you know, saying, wow, they have no equity. You know, the company is going to go bankrupt. They have all this debt and no equity. This is terrible. Well, that's really a function of the company's assets not showing up on the balance sheet. Uh, they, you know, their their main asset is, you know, their ability to, you know, sell Clorox for more than the store brand because, you know, it's a better product because they're efficient manufacturers. They're they're more profitable because, uh, you know, that brand name's been established over the last hundred years. Uh, those, you know, are very, you know, important assets, intangible assets, but they don't show up on the balance sheet. Uh, in this case, you see it in the cash flow, and you look at the debt relative to the cash flow, uh, and it's 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 very reasonable. You know, I think it's in the, the low two times uh, EBITDA range for debt. Um, you know, that's you know, and and that's again, you know, where sometimes it helps to look, you know, at a credit rating or something like that uh, more than, than the balance sheet. But the same thing that distorts, uh, you know, their their debt to capital ratio distorts their return on equity. It looks like it's infinite. Instead, I think it's it's better to consider how much does this company have to reinvest in order to grow. And Clorox, in this case, is kind of an interesting example because they typically convert all of their income on average to free cash flow, which means what you see is what is available to to distribute to shareholders, yet they still have the ability to grow a little bit uh, without having to you know, plow money back into the business in that classic sense. Now, you compare that to a utility, a uh, regulated utility might have an allowed rate of return of 9 or 10%. It's actually very expensive <laughs> to grow the business, uh, because you know, at a, at a low return, it means you have to put a lot more dollars to work in order to get a dollar of earnings growth. Nine or ten percent is still a good number for a utility, uh, but you know, it's 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 very situational. You know, I, I wish there were better rules of thumb on how to think about these things, uh, but uh, you, you do have to get in in there a little bit and and understand how an industry works and the relationship between things like capital spending and, and growth over time, uh, and uh, you know understand you know what the statistics mean as as opposed to to what they are. Hmm. Well, let, let me let's talk maybe more um, I guess strategically in a way. If someone wants to invest in dividend paying stocks, uh, how how many companies should they be looking to to buy into? To have a, a somewhat diversified portfolio of uh, of investments. Part of that would depend, I think, on how much money you're dealing with. Um, you know, if you're just getting started, and maybe you've got, you know, just you know, could be a couple thousand or a few tens of thousands of dollars that you're working with. I don't think you have to own, you know, 25 different stocks and have the burden of dealing with you know, lots of little trades and expenses associated with that. You know, if you've got a half a million dollar or a million dollar portfolio, then maybe the number is more, you know, 20 plus or minus. Uh, my target for the model portfolio I manage is 22 to 28 stocks. And I recognize that not all subscribers are going to buy all the stocks. So, you know, I want to at least have a, a subset of those that are, are buys most of the time and that people can put uh, capital to work, uh, you know, relatively quickly. But, you know, there's a trade-off. Uh, I think most most people over-diversify, and they forget that you know the more diversification you add, yeah, that that limits your risk in in certain ways, but it increases the risk that you don't really understand what you're doing. You know, and if you know, for an individual investor to own say 50 stocks, uh, you just can't can't know that many well enough to make very good decisions about any of them. <clears throat> so, you know, I do this all day, <laughs> every day, and I wonder, you know, uh, you know, is is even, you know, can you know 25 companies well enough? Now, I have the benefit of you know 100 analysts that work from Morningstar to, you know, shepherd me through the. Uh, through the, the weeds and, and, and make my thinking more productive. But, you know, the trade-off is, you know, you don't want to have all your money in just one or two stocks because if, you know, one of them goes bust and you're in a really, really tough shape. But there's not much merit in having so many companies that you wind up with companies going bust and you didn't even know why because you just didn't have time to pay attention to it. So, 
you know, I think 15, 20 in there somewhere, you know, for a sizable portfolio is, is probably the strikes the best balance between knowing what you're doing and, and not being over concentrated. And, and how do you, for those that also own mutual funds or ETFs, how do you work your asset allocation between the stock, individual stocks that you own and all of the mutual funds or ETFs that you might own? Yeah, that has to, you'd have to put them all on the drawing board and uh, see, you know, if, if you own, a lot of, you know, the you know top blue chips that pay good yields, like a General Electric and a Johnson and Johnson and uh, American Electric Power and things like that. You might look into then a dividend fund that you own and realize that the dividend fund owns all those too. You know, are you really getting a benefit from for diversification? You know, in exchange for owning that fund, uh, you know, you may not be getting that much of a benefit, but you're certainly paying for it. Uh, and that's something that is, I think, that makes it kind of tough for uh, funds to really focus on dividend income. You know, this is, I'm, I'm going to even recognize I'm getting into a bit of a tangent here, but if you're running a mutual fund, you know, typical, you know, 100 basis point expense ratio, and you have a portfolio that yields 3%, uh, after the expenses, the dividends that are paid out to the fund shareholders, it's only 2%. You know, so a lot of the income gets, you know, just sucked up by the fees. So the opportunity to own the individual stocks directly, uh, especially among some of these, you know, bigger blue chips that uh, are you know, relatively easier to understand and should be financially stronger than, say, smaller companies or foreign companies, you know, where I think active, you know, funds can, can add more value. You know, you can save yourself, you know, maybe it's 1% of your assets, but maybe it's a third or a quarter of your total income. Uh, so, so yeah, the, loop, loop everything in when you're considering your, your asset allocation. And, you know, I'm not in a, a real good position, you know, to tell people, you know, what they should have in bonds or annuities or other types of equity strategies. Uh, but I wouldn't, I would say this, that, you know, if you're moving into portfolio withdrawal mode, you may still want to have some fixed income exposure, but you'd have to, I think, question, you know, how many other types of equity strategies are really going to help you meet your financial mm -hmm. objectives. You know, a dividend, high quality conservative dividend paying strategy, you know, can, uh, I think, carry most or even all of the load for a lot of uh, of retired investors. It can be their whole equity allocation. They don't need, uh, you, know, a, you know, like a tech sector fund or a gold fund or, you know, a an emerging markets fund in order to be properly diversified. Right, right. So I know for your dividend investor newsletter, which I'm holding the latest copy now, obviously they're all dividend-paying stocks. But would you ever consider, maybe for your own portfolio, a non-dividend-paying stock? Or are those just totally out of the question for you? They're not totally out of the question, uh, but you know, so much of it. I keep coming back to the theme. You know, you have to ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? And I expect, like most investors, that I'm I got to build this portfolio up to where eventually I can live off of it. And that means, you know, how, what's the clearest and, and most reliable path to get there? It's going to be dividend-paying stocks. Now, the the other thing that I have you know, a, a passion for, honestly, is uh, small and especially micro cap stocks. And those typically pay lower yields or, you know, are more frequently just don't pay anything at all. If I can find something that's really cheap and I'm making more of an entrepreneurial or enterprising investment, uh, then maybe dividend isn't immediately part of the situation. You know, I'm interested in a capital gain if I think I have a, a clear line of sight to get something. But it's been a while since I owned any stocks that, that didn't pay uh, a dividend because both uh, professionally and personally, I see again and again that having that dividend income is an advantage to your total return and just the signal that it sends about the kind of business you're dealing with, the kind of management team you're dealing with. Uh, that's that's really valuable as well. So even though there are, I, I own a couple of stocks. I mean, right now I own three stocks that Morningstar doesn't cover. You know, they're small caps. Uh, you know, I own some, some shares in my personal account. All three of those stocks pay dividends too, uh, and that's that's kind of the way I I like it. <laughs> okay. What about uh, you can in, in in the best of the in the best of worlds you can do both you can have a good dividend and you can find a, a stock that uh, that is is cheap enough that you should be able to get a, a real nice capital gain out of it 
Um, that doesn't happen very often, but you know, when it does happen, yeah, take, you know, take advantage of it. If it's, if you think it's, it's something you're trying to accomplish, that's worth trying to accomplish. But you know, I, I'll go back to harp on this one more time about knowing what you're doing in the intelligent investor, uh, Ben Graham's, you know, work, you know, for, for ordinary investors, you know, as opposed to security analysis, which is, you know, a real heavy textbook type tome. Uh, and you know, he very early on, you know, separated between the defensive slash passive investor, uh, w- for which he gave one set of prescriptions for how they should deal with their money, and the uh, enterprising slash entrepreneurial investor, you know, who you know for whom he had other recommendations. You really have to decide very clearly which you are, and then and and perhaps you're doing some of both. Uh, but then you want two different accounts and you want to think about them and operate with them separately. You need that strategic clarity so that you just don't start wandering all over the map. Mm, uh, right. I think it's it's very valued, valuable to know what it is that you're trying to do before you go ahead and try to do it. <laughs> right, right. Well, let me let me take a kind of a left turn with this next question. Because um, I know you focus a lot on REITs. Obviously, they, they, they can have high yields. Are, but today, are REITs, or at least U.S. REITs, overvalued? In general, I think so. And that's, uh, you know, a bit of a problem for me. You know, I get, uh, you know, questions about interest rates. And it's sometimes it's kind of frustrating because I sometimes I feel like people treat me like I'm a bond manager or something like that. <laughs> I, I assume that interest rates are going to go up. Not that there's anything wrong with managing uh, a bond portfolio. <laughs> I mean, I, I assume that interest rates are going to go up longer term. That's, a, I think, an important planning assumption when you're looking at valuations. And most of the REITs that are out there right now are not priced in a fashion that they will be able to sustain their, their valuation levels if, say, the 10-year Treasury goes to 3 or 4%. They're, they're going to come down in price. There are, are a couple, well, actually, right now, I just recently bought some shares of, of one REIT called Ventas that's in the, the healthcare area that... You know, I think that their growth prospects are undervalued. You know, relative to other REITs, it it, it looks pretty cheap, uh, and I expect it to do well even as interest rates uh, eventually rise. Uh, but across the board, you know, I would like interest rates, you know, to to kind of get on with it. Let's yeah, let's have right. interest rates go up because I really am much less interested in the quoted value of these stocks. You know, in the short term than I am in having the opportunity to reinvest dividend income and, and put new money to work at higher yields because those higher yields are going to correlate to higher total returns over the long run. Now, and and it's, it's a difficult mentality to adapt you know, yourself to, which is I'm not going to look at the statement value. I'm only going to look at the income. Like I'm you know, going to cover my eyes here while I'm even talking just you know, mentally. I'm not going to look at the statement value. I'm going to let the market do what it's going to do you know, from month to month. Over a series of years, definitely you, you want and should expect capital appreciation. Uh, but in the short term, when things are bouncing around, you have lots of stuff going on that you can't predict, you know, your best defense is to you know, focus on the income and pay enough attention to valuations so that you don't buy a stock that simply can't sustain its current price. If interest rates go, you know, if the ten-year Treasury goes to four percent, because someday I'm sure it's going to. I may not know when, uh, but uh, REITs as well as utilities had gotten to a point uh, here, you know, maybe a, a month, six weeks ago, that they were so overpriced that I couldn't find anything, you know, to buy. Right. You know, now the momentum is broken. Interest rates have come up a little bit, but the share prices have really reacted quite strongly to the, the downside. And now I'm happy about it because now I get the opportunity to put some more money to work. And it's not my entire portfolio. There are other parts of the portfolio that have done uh, well to offset that effect. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of moving pieces. Uh, REITs, I think they, you, know, the, the, you need to apply the same kind of quality standards to them that you would apply to any other sort of operating business. Uh, but over the long run, I think you want those to play a, a valuable role in an income strategy uh, and higher interest rates and low, you know, higher dividend yields, even at the expense of lower stock prices. Yeah, that's going to help, not right. hurt your ability to compound your future income. Right. Um, on a, a question about the tools that you use to track your portfolio, I mean, I use, among other tools, Morningstar's Portfolio Manager. Uh, is that what you use to track the dividend uh, investor 
inde- uh, portfolio that you manage, or do you guys have proprietary tools? How do you track all of the dividends and the returns, the dividend reinvestments? Yeah, I I built my own spreadsheet from scratch to do that, which maybe that's a little bit of my OCD uh, showing up or, some, or something. But, uh, you know, there were proprietary statistics that I wanted to track that unfortunately aren't even available in, in our portfolio manager uh, on Morningstar.com. Now, I use all of our, our ratings information. You know, and that uh, information that is available in Portfolio Manager feeds right through to the Dividend Investor website. But there's one statistic that, uh, in particular that I wanted to calculate, and that was you know, dividend growth for my portfolio. Uh, which is is very important, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I I always come back to to balance. You know, it's like I want the high yield, but I also want the growth. I'm going to insist on both every time, every stock. Mm. And if I'm not getting a growing dividend, maybe the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to get cut. Uh, so in order to track that, I think in terms of you know starting the year, let's say again hypothetical hundred thousand dollar account, I've got a four thousand uh, dollar income stream off of that. That's a four percent yield. After a year, uh, I wanted a way to you know, say, okay, how much has my income grown and how? Because if I'm reinvesting my dividend income, then that's going to buy more shares and increase my income. But I want to also look specifically at what are the companies doing for me. And if after a year, let's say all else being equal, that $4,000 has gone to 4300 then now I know it's, that was a 7.5% growth in my income just from the companies. I didn't have to do anything to, to get it. It was just a matter of the companies that are out there working hard, using my capital as a shareholder, growing their businesses, and in turn paying me more, sharing that prosperity with me. That, I think, is, is a better reflection of how your portfolio is doing you know, in, a, in a year, you know, the, the span of 12 months, uh, than whether or not uh, the market value went up 30% or down 20 you right, know, I would right. much rather have that underlying income because it's going gonna, it's gonna to converge uh, with your market value over time. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that statistic because last night I was doing my own spreadsheets of a number of companies, and I was tracking compound annual growth rate of dividends, revenue, net income, and I noticed that uh, dividend growth was significantly higher than uh, earnings per share, right, among other statistics. And I'm thinking of IBM in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I went to the payout ratio, and the payout ratio hadn't changed much. Uh, and so that left, uh, well, they were buying back a lot of shares. So the number of shares yep. outstanding have gone down. Um, you talk about this in your book, but I'm, uh, I'm curious if you can give us sort of your sense. Are, are share buybacks good for investors? Mostly not. <laughs> Um, I don't mind share buybacks playing a supplementary, uh, secondary role in returning cash to shareholders, but they simply aren't a, they're, they're not peri passu with dividends. They're not a substitute for dividends. Uh, they, you know, they're, they, you know, and all you have to do is ask, where does the cash go? You know, IBM's a good example where, you know, they have spent, uh, well, tens of billions of dollars on share repurchases. You know, lots of those shares bought back at higher prices than the stock trades for now. If they had paid the same sum out as dividends over the years, then shareholders would just be richer to exactly that amount. Uh, instead, by you know keeping control of that cash and essentially forcing. Uh, their shareholders to reinvest what could otherwise have been cash dividends back into IBM shares, because that's kind of what a share buyback is. is it's a, a mandatory uh, dividend reinvestment program. You know, that has not worked out real well. Um, and, you know, even if the stock had gone up, you'd still say, okay, well, they, they, they say they're going to return $20 billion to shareholders, but if only $4 billion of that is dividends, and $16 billion is share buybacks, well, how much are they actually paying and to whom? Well, $4 billion goes to the people who actually still own the stock, and $16 billion went to the people who used to own it, the people who sold, the least loyal shareholders, the people who were, you know, summoned a ride out of town. That's now my idea of how you really want to share the prosperity of a business. Uh, is, is by you know b- paying people to go away. I, I can't remember that, that. That's a brilliant quote, uh, and I, I, it's not mine. Uh, 
and I can't remember quite who who used that. It was a mutual fund manager uh, who, who used that phrase, you know, to describe share buybacks. You know, didn't like companies, you know, who paid people to go away. But it's there's a real uh, real element of truth there. And share buybacks, statistically, for the market overall, are still much more popular among companies than uh, than dividends, and it's because they don't instill the same level of discipline. Mm-hmm. You know, companies can turn the buyback spigot on and then they can shut it off and divert the cash elsewhere, make a big acquisition, you know, expand the empire, CEO gets a big pay rise out of it. You know, maybe shareholders benefit, more like more than likely they don't. Uh, or you've got managers who are paid on the basis of earnings per share growth as opposed to absolute earnings growth. Right, right. And share buybacks help with that, and dividends don't, even though the dividends provide the shareholder with a more certain return, a more, you know, something they can actually put in their pocket. So, you know, where share buybacks come in, I think, is uh, you know when the company has excess cash. They already pay a good dividend, but they don't want to raise it to a point where they might have to cut it or that it would be you know, create financial pressure in a future downturn. You know, to use buybacks uh, as a way of, of returning a little bit of additional cash uh, after a big dividend has already been paid, yeah, I typically don't complain about that mm-hmm. too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even in those cases, when do companies buy back the most stock? When they're the most profitable and they're generating the most cash, well, where do you think their stock prices are? Right. You know, when that's happening, they're at at the peak, uh, and uh, some of those shares get reissued at much, 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 much lower prices in the next downturn. That's what we saw with the banks that were buying back tens of billions of dollars worth of shares and then reissuing them. Uh, you know, just you know, a year or two later, you know, in the, the heat of financial crisis at very low prices. Right. Uh, dividend doesn't hurt anybody. You know, it, it, I suppose there's a very rare case where maybe a company paid out, you know, too much in, in a dividend and they didn't reinvest in, in the business or they stressed out their balance sheet and perhaps a more conservative uh, approach would have uh, served everybody better in the long run. But for every instance like that, there's probably 100 or 500 instances uh, where the company isn't paying out enough of a dividend and shareholders on balance are, are going to suffer as right. a result. Right. Well, um, I'm curious. Your book, I think, came out in 2000. I want to say 2005. Um, is there another book in in your future? You... It was actually early 2008. Oh, eight. 2008. You're right. I'm looking at so, it now. Yeah, I, I was writing that through uh, through the peak of of the last uh, the last bull market. Yeah, you, you talk in, about uh, lo- in 2007. You talk about low five percent interest rates in the book, which I found kind of funny given our environment today. Yeah, when I look at my own spreadsheet, you know, yeah. I can, you know, I've got an interest rate series in there. It's like, wow, we had five percent, you know, back, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, and now that, you know, it seemed like uh, just, um, you know, money falling from the sky. So, is there going to be another book, or are you, are you, are you done writing, or is there another book in you that we're going to hear about? Well, I don't often tell this story, but I'm going to tell it because it's, it, it provides perhaps the best backdrop for why I say no. Is I, when I was writing the, the book, uh, I got to find out just how good the service is in an emergency room when you walk in and you announce you have chest pains, Uh-oh. which is what I did three weeks before my deadline, and I felt like everything was you know, just in total chaos and, and disarray, and I was going to blow my deadlines, and you know, then, of course, the world would come to an end. Well, they put you in a room right away. They call in the doctors and the nurses, and they strapped all this equipment on me, and they started snickering. I could snee- see around the corner, and uh, they disconnected it all, and they gave me a bottle of Xanax and sent me home. <laughs> uh, so, no, not so interested in writing another book, right. to be honest. All right. Uh, but the, the, what the book accomplished was to have this long-form, open-ended discussion where I could get into a lot more of the details of how to analyze a business, how to analyze dividend safety, how to analyze dividend growth, uh, like some of the, the, the things we talked about earlier, like Clorox not having any shareholders' equity and what does that mean for you know, their, their financial condition. Uh, you know, those kind of things you know, I could cover in the book where it's very hard to cover that in, in the newsletter. The newsletter is you know, more oriented around what's going on and, and, and what the best ideas are now. But the newsletter is basically an extension of the book. It's a converse, you know, piece of this conversation that uh, gets added to 
uh, each month. And then there's my online comments and whenever I make some trades, you know, that goes out by email. So, you know, that all is continuing to develop uh, the conversation uh, that, uh, you know, was started with the first issue of the newsletter back in January 2005. And, and then there was the book released in, in early 2008. Uh, the book has lots of examples uh, that are dated and some that are frankly wrong. I mean, you write write a book like that, you know, 300 and some pages, you know, you can look back now. I said some really stupid things. You know, I think I pointed out that there had been more utilities that had cut their dividends in the previous 10 years than banks. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was dumb. Uh, it was accurate. <laughs> Because the utility industry had gone through the Enron period, you know, the implosion of energy trading and, and merchant generation and all the rest of that. And there had been quite a few dividend cuts. And banks hadn't had a serious downturn, you know, you know going back to the S&L crisis. Uh, so it was a, a true statement, but it really underestimated just the, the risk profile of, of the banking industry. So a lot more examples in there about banks uh, than, than I would have today if I was writing a book. Interesting. But that's, that's the nature of how things evolve. And, and what I found is that the core principles that I've really had since, since the first year, you know, that, uh, you know, is it safe? Will it grow? What's the return you know, framework for evaluating a, a stock? You know, looking at the dividend income and the growth of that income over the course of a year as an indication for how I'm really doing and, you know, not really messing around so much with these head-to-head -head comparisons with the S&P. You know, those types of principles, you know, that I laid out early on in, in the newsletter right. and then uh, amplified uh, with the book, uh, those have really stood the test of time very well. I mean, where, where I've made mistakes, and believe me, I've made plenty, it's been in execution. It's been in, you know, buying stocks that didn't turn out to, to actually meet the standards that the strategy uh, should have, have demanded from them. Right. You know, I owned lots of banks uh, going into the crash, and I learned some, some painful lessons. You know, leverage, you know, how, you know, if there's a lot of leverage, however that's defined, that is your enemy. Uh, as a shareholder who's looking for a dividend, because those creditors are always going to get paid first. Uh, so, you know, and that's that again is where the newsletter comes in real handy. You know, I like uh, that the book is is out there. I'm glad I don't ever have to write another one <laughs> or, or rewrite that one. Uh, but the, the the lessons that are in there, they still apply, and I'm still using that that same framework every day, managing our portfolio and, and writing about uh, about the strategy. Well, that's great, and I really appreciate your time. I've I've kept you a long time. Let, let me ask you one last question: For folks that want to learn more about investing in dividend stocks, obviously they've got your book, The Ultimate Dividend Playbook, and I'll I'll link to it in the show notes that go with this podcast. Are there other books, resources, websites, blogs that you think are good that have really influenced your thinking on dividend investing? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I, I hate to say that, uh, but it's there aren't a whole lot of people that are out there, especially in, in sort of the Wall Street institutional universe, who really prioritize dividend yield the way – uh, my strategy has has come to do. Um, you know, I've got some friends in the business who who run some similar strategies, uh, but it's it's hard to find. And, and maybe maybe this is just you know the you know function of the way I think, or maybe I'm just being conceited or something like that. But when I see other people talking about dividends, I see people glom onto one end of the spectrum or the other. They're either very excited about dividend growth. You know, dividends growing 15, 20, 25 percent a year, and then I look at the stock, and the yield is only one percent, and uh, that kind of growth rate really can't be kept up forever. And most of the growth is an expanding payout ratio; it's not growth in earnings. And you know, I can kind of pick it apart and say, yeah, that really wouldn't work for me. Or much worse, people tend to glom on to the mortgage REITs and the BDCs, and they're buying these black box financial creations. Uh, that really are very hard to understand and have loads of risk and uh, can blow people's portfolios up. You know, but you know, there's a lot of attraction in the idea of a double-digit dividend yield. If they really existed uh, and and were safe and sound and reliable and could still grow, that would be great. But that's that's just not the case. So I tend my I tend to to have a high yield relative to most of the strategies that are offered by mutual funds and even ETFs. But I'm still insisting on a lot of quality. I'm still insisting on uh, on dividend growth from all my holdings, 
And uh, off the top of my head, I mean, I only know of one uh, mutual fund manager uh, of the Federated Strategic Value Dividend Fund uh, who runs a a strategy very similar to mine. And, uh, you know, we talk on the phone every so often and, you know, we just happen to own a lot of the same stocks because there are only so many to to pick from and we do think alike. But, uh, you know, I think what's more important uh, then, then finding you know lots of different voices, you know, from people who are talking about dividends is to remember something that I, I said earlier, which is that you know a, a good dividend doesn't turn a bad business into a good investment. So the best resources uh, for me are the ones that make sure that I'm buying good businesses. And Morningstar's own research provides a lot of that. Uh, but the kind of books that I've I've read in in you know the course of developing my strategy, it's been reading Graham and Dot, it's been uh, reading uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, the first book I read on investing when I got interested in the stock market when I was 13 years old was uh, One Up on Wall Street. You know, I'm okay. a, a big Peter Lynch fan. You know, these were not people who necessarily prioritized dividends. But they're you know keenly interested in how the businesses were operating and you know what the numbers you know what do the numbers mean and how does this turn into a, a good investment versus a bad investment you know to have that sort of dividend overlay where I'm going to say yeah I want a good business and a fair price but I also want this dividend what it does is it narrows down your investment universe uh, makes it more manageable and frankly gives you a better class of companies uh, right. to use these sort of timeless principles to, to pick through and evaluate and, and try to pick the best ones. Well, that, that's great. I appreciate it. You know, I, I've, I haven't finished reading it, but I did, I've did. i taken a peek at Buffett's uh, uh, shareholder letter that went out last week. And I think maybe if you're still doing the, your newsletter, your dividend investor newsletter in 20 years, you might, maybe, you might be able to add Berkshire Hathaway to your uh, to your portfolio, because <laughs> uh, you know they might just be paying a dividend then, but uh, not not now. Yeah, I I actually what was it maybe two I want to say it was maybe two or three years ago that uh, he had taken on this this question about uh, dividends div- about a dividend from Berkshire yeah. 2012 and it. yeah. 2012, and I wrote a uh, cover story uh, for Dividend Investor the following month. You know, it's titled "In Buffett We Trust, All Others Pay Cash." <laughs> right. And that actually, you know, I thought it was kind of clever, but it also hit uh, <laughs> the nail on the on the head in terms of how I felt about that. Which is, you know, he, he's the exception that proves the rule. He's been able to invest in basically any kind of industry, almost any kind of industry whether it was you know, listed securities or privately issued securities or swallowing whole businesses, and has been able to generate very high returns on capital for a very long time. He can go anywhere and do anything. Right. You know, can General Mills do that? You know, I love General Mills, but if General Mills decided that they were going to buy a, a machine tools manufacturer in Israel, uh, you know, like, like Buffett did, you know, Iskar, that's become a, a big earner for, for Berkshire, you know, I don't expect General Mills to be able to do something like that and pull it off. I don't want them to. When General Mills pays me a dividend, they're giving me the opportunity to do with those profits whatever I want. And you know, high on that list is to allocate it to other businesses that I get to select, other investments, other uses of capital, that I get to make those decisions as opposed to the executives and the board at, at General Mills making those decisions. right. right. You know, so yeah, Buffett he can can go anywhere, and he's created a clientele, a, a class of shareholders who you know they they accept that deal. They're not looking for dividends, um, but from other types of companies, I want General Mills to be the best cereal manufacturer and the best yogurt manufacturer, and you know they work very hard at that. Uh, and the profits that are left over after they've reinvested what they can in in a business that doesn't grow very fast, it, you know, does does fairly well, but you know. It's, not Apple or anything like that. The rest of the profits come back to shareholders so that shareholders can reallocate the capital. And that's not just good for General Mills as a business by keeping him focused on the food business. It's not just good good for me as a shareholder because you know, I'm getting the opportunity to control what's happening with the capital instead of having all the control remain with uh, the companies themselves. It's good for capitalism, <laughs> for capital to get out there and to, to re, you know, be recycled and to circulate so that uh, mature businesses that don't need all the cash they generate 
uh, can provide that money back to the market and the market can reallocate it. Individual investors uh, can, can reallocate it instead of it being siloed. Uh, you know, Google is, is kind of the example there where, you know, yeah, it's a great business there in online search. Uh, but does this really translate into them being the ones who will invent the self-driving car? You know, maybe they can pull it off, but the odds of having, you know, back-to-back, you know, once-in-a-century type innovations, you know, is pretty low. Right. And uh, I think, you, you're, you're, you know, Google would be an interesting investment. Uh, I think it's a good business. But it doesn't have a dividend at all. If there was a good dividend policy in place as, as part of a good capital allocation strategy, uh, then I would be interested in owning that as a, even as no, a tech I, stock. And I, I agree completely on, on particularly on Google. It just it, it would it would it would add some discipline to how they're allocating their capital. And right now, I, you know, they make so much money and they don't pay a dividend. They don't have to have discipline. They can spend it however yeah. they want. And they they've they've spent more money on projects that they then just shut down. Uh, anyway, that's <laughs> that could be a whole other podcast. Well, I promise that was my last question, but I do have one. This is a quick. This is a quick one, though. In your dividend investor, do you automatically reinvest the dividends into the companies that paid them, or do they go to cash and then you decide where to to invest the money? The latter. Okay. I, I call that active dividend reinvestment yeah. as opposed to to passive or automatic. And the automatic plans are nice, especially if you're dealing with a small portfolio and you can have those dividends reinvested for free. Uh, that's just more efficient. Uh, but if you're, you know, collecting, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year worth of dividends or, or more, you know, then pick the best stock at the time uh, to uh, put that capital into. Uh, you know, I think that adds a little bit of value relative to just having every dividend go back into the company that paid it. Yeah, one problem I've had, this has nothing to do with really active dividend investing, but it's with the Morningstar portfolio manager. It's easy to, to click a button and have it automatically show the reinvestment of your dividend. But if you don't want to do that, i got to talk to someone at Morningstar. It's not as easy to use the portfolio manager if you want to do active dividend investment. Yeah, it, well, it turns into individual trades. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. And then you've got a cash balance to, uh, right. contend with in the meantime, you know, the accounting gets a little bit more difficult, but all these things always take place in the context of, of trade-offs. You know, am I adding enough value to my portfolio over the long run to have it be worth the work or is the automatic strategy, passive strategy, the, the way to go? Uh, thus far I've been satisfied that I'm, I'm getting enough value from the active uh, approach to, to continue okay. doing it, but Great. different people are going to have uh, have different looks at that. Sure. Well, Josh, listen, I really appreciate your time. Uh, big fan of your work. Love your book. And uh, again, thank you for being on the show. Wonderful questions, wonderful conversations. You know, very happy to join you here today. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview uh, with Josh. As I said, I'd, I'd read his book a number of years ago. I reread it. If you have any interest in investing in individual stocks uh, or already do and you've not read his book, I, I can't recommend it enough. It really gets into some it, – it, it, there's actually a number of things I like about it. First of all, he talks about a number of very – you know, of specific companies and sort of their their history in terms of their performance. And I think that historical perspective – is extremely important. So so often we get hung up in sort of the day-to-day of the market and we we neglect to sort of take a step back and look at the big picture, which for me is at a minimum of five years and more like 10 years or more. And Josh does that in his book. The other thing he does is, you know, he, he, he doesn't shy away from the math. I mean, there's, you know, it's not complicated math at all, actually. It's quite easy. easy. Um, but he, he digs into the numbers. He digs into the financial statements. He digs into... Uh, you know, their, their balance sheet and how, um, uh, you know, what kind of debt they have and their cash position and looks at their earnings, their dividend growth, their dividend payout ratio, um, and, and these sorts of things which are important to understand if you're going to invest uh, in individual uh, companies. And he walks through that using a number of different companies um, as very specific examples. And But that being said, it's a very easy book to read. It's not... Uh, you know, you don't need to have, you know, advanced math. It's not calculus. It's not rocket science. Um, but I, I guarantee you, you'll learn something new uh, when you read it. I, I, I did. I learned something new when I reread it. Uh, and the, the other thing I like about it, and one of the reasons I also subscribe to Morningstar's uh, Dividend Investor Newsletter, and this is going to sound odd, but it's this. Um, 
Josh and I take a slightly different approach to investing, even though we're both very focused on, by and large, dividend-paying stocks. My approach to investing is a little different than Josh's. It's not the same. And actually, I find that to be one of the reasons his work is so valuable to me, because it is a little different than my approach. And it helps me refine my approach. Uh, it, it, it challenges me, right, which is you want. You don't want someone who just agrees with you all the time, right? Right. And so Josh's approach and I are a little different. In his dividend investing portfolio, as he mentioned, he's looking for 3 to 5% dividend yield. I don't look at it that way. Um, I'm wanting to buy, you know, as, I'm, as I know Josh is, great companies at a fair price, but I'm, I'm absolutely willing to consider companies that pay much lower dividends than even 3% if I think their growth prospects uh, are very good. And uh, for his dividend investing newsletter, he's focused on three to five percent, which is which is great. It's a, it's a, um, uh, it, it, there's no right or wrong here. Well, sometimes there's right and wrong. I don't think here there. I don't think that's the case here, but it is a slightly different approach. The other way we differ a little bit is I'm much more open to share buybacks. Um, he is too, but uh, and, and he's right to criticize them. There are a lot of times when companies buy back shares in a way that doesn't doesn't add value to shareholders. Uh, but if if a company is smart about the way they approach share buybacks, I prefer them over dividends. Uh, for one thing, uh, there, there, there's no taxes involved. I don't have to pay taxes on a share buyback. I do want a dividend. Um, and long term, it, it, will, it can increase my dividends down the road. It can increase return on equity. It, it can do a lot of very good, my, my, you know, increase my share of corporate earnings. So uh, I, I tend to be a little more, um, I guess, open to share buybacks than, than some others. But again, uh, the fact that he and I have slightly different approaches, not dramatically different, but slightly different approaches, I find helpful because it, it allows me to, to, to sort of challenge my own thinking on this, refine it. Uh, hear how he's how he's thinking through things. He's obviously had a very a very good track record uh, with uh, the p- portfolio that he's managed as part of the um, dividend investor newsletter. Uh, so um, can't recommend that enough. His book is fantastic, the Ultimate Dividend Playbook. Highly recommend it. Uh, I've got a hardback copy that's completely marked up and trashed. And uh, I, as I said, I've read it a couple of times now, and I'll read it again for sure. Um, you know, it's other, the other thing I'll say about this book, before I move to my own portfolio, I want to share with you, for better or worse, my performance. Um it's the kind of book that's all, that, that will be a reference book for you. It's not just the kind of thing you read once and stick on a shelf and never look at it again. If you're evaluating companies, you'll pull out his book and go back and walk, and, and walk through sections of it where he describes how to evaluate certain aspects of a company, and you'll apply it to, to companies that you're, you're evaluating. I know I do. So in that sense, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that I, I keep close to me on the shelf and in fact, I'm looking at it now, and we'll pull it down um, as I'm evaluating companies. There are other books uh, that kind of fit into that mold for me. His is certainly one of them. So as I was preparing for the interview with Josh, one of the things I decided to do was, uh, and I'm a little embarrassed that I hadn't done it before, was to figure out my return from the individual stocks that I own. You know, The majority of our investments are in mutual funds, ETFs, well, mainly mutual funds mainly index funds. But um, I started investing in individual stocks. Actually, it goes back to 2010 when I opened up my first SEP IRA. My current portfolio is based on purchases that began in 2012. And I I, I couldn't, you know, until about uh, two weeks ago, if you'd asked me, well, you know, you're investing in individual stocks, Rob. I mean, are you beating the market? Why are you doing this? Uh, How does your, how do your returns compare? I didn't know the answer to that. Now, I, you know, I wasn't totally oblivious to how the, the stocks had performed. I knew that they had done well, uh, but of course, so had the market. So, you know, when the you know, market was up, what, uh, 32% in 2013, it was up um, uh, double digits last year, I believe, uh, if I got it right. Um, so the fact that stocks, my stocks had done well um, in and of itself it doesn't tell you a whole lot. I, I, I couldn't tell you how they compared to the S&P 500. So what I did, I do use Portfolio Manager, which is uh, a tool offered by Morningstar that allows you to track uh, portfolios. And you can have multiple portfolios. So I have one for all of my investments. Uh, But then what I did was I created one that just tracked my individual stocks. Now, you know, if you've listened to the show for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of personal capital. I check personal capital every day. I think it's the easiest way to keep track of your 
well, a number of things, your asset allocation, your fees, your performance, as well as, uh, you know, your budget, your expenses and your income. Uh, and I use that every day and you can check it out, doughroller.net slash PC. That is an affiliate link. Um, but the thing that portfolio manager gives you that personal capital doesn't is a level of detail about mutual funds and even your performance. Uh, it, it really gives you a level of detail unparalleled in any other tool that I've seen. Now, that, that's the, the, the good thing. You say, well, then, Rob, why do you bother with personal capital? Because Morningstar is a much more manual process. You know, you can't link your accounts like you can with personal capital. Uh, you've got to manually enter information, and it takes a lot of time. So unless you've got a good reason to do it, uh, a lot of people aren't going to bother with it, and that's fine. You don't need to. Um, but I, I like to have that level of detail, and particularly with my individual stocks. So I spent what was hours entering all the way back to 2012, and then I had to t take into account all of the dividends and the reinvestment of dividends, and the portfolio manager at Morningstar has tools to help you do that. But, you know, it's a pretty manual process. Uh, and so I did. I got to tell you, I was I was stunned at the results. I, I I've clobbered the S and P five hundred. <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to say that. Um, of course, it's only over three and a half years. You know, check back in twenty years and see how I've done. Uh, but let me just give you the results, and then I'll tell you what I've invested in. So as I said, this this goes back to two thousand and twelve. Uh, that year, the S and P five hundred returned eight point three percent. That that includes reinvestment of dividends, eight point three one percent. My investments returned 26.86%. This man, it had a good year. I don't know what to tell you. The next year, the S&P 500 just hit it out of the park, 32.39%. I beat it then. I actually had 36.4%. I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize that I'd done that um, or that my investments had done that. Uh, last year, the S&P was 13.69%. My investments returned 24.51%. This year, of course, we're only in March. The s and is up about a percent. I'm up 1.84%. Now, the thing that really caught my eye is that if you look at the three-year average, I'm up just under 29% uh, compound annual growth rate. Uh, index up 17.24%. Uh, so a remarkable three-year run. Boy, if I could do that every year, um, that would be something. Unfortunately, I can't. Eventually, reality will set in. How you perform, you know, over three years, you can just get lucky. Uh, and, and, and I would, if I had to bet, I'd put myself in that category. You know, a couple of big, big positions helped me. I mean, I bought Apple at $56. It's doubled, uh, plus dividends, actually more than doubled. Um, I bought Ford at a time when it was trading really low, and it doubled. Uh, my investment in Berkshire Hathaway, which doesn't pay a dividend, has done really well. Uh, and so in some ways, I think, you know, I just got fortunate with the timing. Uh, so what do I own? Well, I've mentioned a couple. As I said, I own Apple. Uh, I owned more of it at one point. I actually, I, all the Apple stock that I own, I bought at about fifty-six bucks. Uh, I've given some to charity uh, since then. So my, but even still, um, you know, it, what I still own has done extremely well. As I mentioned, I own Berkshire Hathaway. I bought that in two batches, uh, and uh, I own um, Pepsi, Ford. And then more recently, I bought ExxonMobil and I bought Deer and Company. You know, John Deere, nothing runs like a deer. Uh, it's interesting. Berkshire Hathaway recently purchased Deer. They recently sold ExxonMobil, uh, and uh, I've bought both. Um, and so that's my portfolio. That's it. So Apple, Berkshire Hathaway, Deer, ExxonMobil, Ford, and Pepsi. Six positions. Um, and and in in terms of dollar amounts, it's not an insignificant amount of my portfolio. It comes out to a about uh, 10%, just under 10% of my portfolio uh, is in these individual stocks. Um, the other 90% are in mutual funds. And, you know, I think for those interested in investing in individual stocks, particularly as you get started, it's important to sort of carve out what I would think is a relatively small amount of your portfolio uh, until you're comfortable with, uh, you know, investing in individual stocks. And that may take some time. It takes a lot of learning. And I'm still in that process. I guess you never stop learning, really. Uh, but I will say a couple of things about the portfolio and then what I plan for some upcoming podcasts. So the first thing is, I have, as I said, six positions. I can't fathom the number of stocks going above 10. Probably 7 to 10 is where I'll end up. 
And I would be very comfortable investing a pretty significant amount of money in seven to 10 stocks. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, you're talking a million, even 5 million, 10 million. I don't have that kind of money yet. <laughs> uh, but I would be as, as part of an uh, overall diversified portfolio with mutual funds, ETFs, as well as individual stocks. I'm not going to want to um, manage a portfolio of 20, 30, 40 uh, companies. It's just too much. It's too much analysis. And I think over eventually, I think the diversity actually hurts you, again, assuming this is just one piece of an overall diversified portfolio. Um, I'm much more comfortable investing in a, a smaller number of what I think are excellent companies, excellent companies that I can buy at a reasonable price. That, that's kind of what I'm trying uh, 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 to do. The other thing is, is you really become invested uh, in these companies where you, and, and what I mean by that is you really start to learn these companies. You listen to the earnings calls, you read their 10Ks, you read their uh, 10Qs. Um, you even follow their products. You know, I'm, I'm looking at Wells Fargo and one of the things I'm going to do is go into a Wells Fargo branch and talk to them about a business account. I want to experience Wells Fargo. Uh, you know, of course, it's just, you know, going into one bank, but I want to understand how they do business. I want to go to a, a, a seller of deer equipment, John Deere equipment, talk to the owner, um, those sorts of things. You know, of course, I'm a big uh, buyer of Apple products. So um, I, I like to get kind of invested, if you will, in these companies. I've been to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting the last two years, took my family. Uh, I'm not going to go this year, but I've been there the last two years. And so I like to really be, become involved in the companies that I invest in. And you just can't do that if you own 20, 30, 40 companies. It's hard enough to do it with six, let alone a few more that I might uh, uh, add. And the reality is you don't need a lot of companies to have an incredibly diversified portfolio. Ten companies, uh, even all, all U.S.-based companies, is incredibly diverse, even the six that I own. You think about the different industries they're in. Uh, you know, Ford, of course, uh, the auto industry, ExxonMobil Energy, um, Apple is a consumer products kind of technology company, but consumer products. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is all kinds of things, right? Insurance, um, uh, financials, they own American Express, Wells Fargo, uh, transportation, they own a railroad. Um, so they they have it's it's in, in some ways Berkshire Hathaway is a is a large cap mutual fund. I mean it's really has exposure to a lot of, of industries. And all of these companies uh, have exposure overseas, right? Ford has tremendous exposure outside the U.S. So does Pepsi. Obviously, ExxonMobil does. Deer does. Apple does. Um, so, you know, even with just these six companies, it, it, it is a very diversified uh, portfolio uh, of, of investments. So, that's my portfolio. What I plan to do in upcoming podcasts, I know not everyone invests in individual stocks. This topic will be of, I think, uh, of, of interest to a lot of people, but not everyone. Although I suppose that may be true of every show. You can't, you can't uh, appeal to everyone in every uh, podcast. But I am going to start covering my analysis of individual stocks, what I'm looking at, what's caught my attention at the moment, how I'm evaluating these companies, why I'm buying them, why I'm not buying uh, other companies, and even digging into some of the details. How do I look at their earnings? How do I evaluate their balance sheet? What are some of the the ratios and relationships that I look at? You know, and, and a lot of times for me, it's just asking questions. I'm looking at IBM now. The return on equity is ridiculous. It's like over 70%. So I'm asking questions. Why is their return on equity so high? Um, if you've studied the stock, you already know, but don't tell anyone, don't give it away. That'll be for a future show. Um, and, and then is it even a good measure for, for that company? Is that what I should be looking at, the return on equity? Why is that an important measure and how does it vary depending on the industry? And so all these sorts of questions, and I'm going to cover them, you know, a little bit at a time in future shows. So that's the plan. And that's my portfolio. You know, I, by the way, if my portfolio craters <laughs> and I get clobbered this year, I will share that with you too. So I'll give you an update maybe once a month on how it's how it's uh, performing. But I got to tell you, I was really surprised to see that it had outperformed the market uh, so much over the last three and a half years. Boy, I'd love to see it do that for the next 30, but <laughs> I know that that's not going to happen. So there you go. Again, hope you enjoyed the interview with uh, Josh Peters. If you have any questions about this or any personal finance or investing topic, you know how to reach me, net. I'd love to hear from you. I do respond to every email 
and I enjoy hearing your questions. And maybe you don't have a question, you just have a topic you'd like me to cover. Please shoot me an email, email dr at dorlanot.net. Hey, until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.